welcome to today's lecture which is like which is lesson number 26 of the course on industrial automation and control today we are going to take our first look at hydraulic control systems and we'll review some elementary basic concepts and then we'll first look at the components which make a hydraulic control systems in the subsequent lectures we shall see some special components and we shall see as to how these components can be used to make a hydraulic control system so we give, so we begin here before we begin we look at the instructional objectives so the instructional objectives are basically to describe the principle of principles of operation of hydraulic systems and understand its advantages what is involved and why it is uh, almost irreplaceably used in certain applications there are certain advantages then uh, of course we have to be the main purpose of the lesson is to be familiar with the basic hydraulic system components and their roles in the system what they do and describe the constructional and functional aspects of hydraulic pumps and motors how they function and be familiar with directional valves and control valves they are very important components so we will take a somewhat detailed look at these so we begin with the fundamental principle of hydraulics which is based on essentially on Pascal's law which says that pressure applied to a fluid is transmitted equally in all directions. So, if we apply pressure in a fluid at a given point then it the, that same pressure is transmitted through the fluid which is supposed to be incompressible and gets applied everywhere else. So, so, we actually use this property of incompressible fluids to transmit forces. So, we will apply basically hydraulic control systems are used to create motions under uh, in various situations very precise motions uh, against heavy loads. So, high force has to be transmitted and precise displacement and velocities have to be created that is the basic area where hydraulic systems find majority of its applications. So, what we essentially are going to do is that we are going to apply pressure to a fluid at one end and the same pressure is, is going to get transmitted and act on some other body. So, when pressure acts on, on a body it creates force. So, we expect that that force will create a motion right. Now, as I said that pressure determines force and 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 how does it determine force? Pressure is given as force per un, per force per unit area of the application of the pressure. So, you see interestingly we should look at this we have also learned this in school that if we so, you see that if we apply let us let us take this very elementary example which we have which is the basic uh, principle of a hydraulic press which was one of the first hydraulic machines which was. So, if we have a small piston here and if we have a large piston here large means the area is large as you can see and if we place a load so this is let us say 1 kg then the pressure here is basically this 1 kg force by a1 now the same this is a1 and this is a2 so, by Pascal's law now this same pressure is going to get transmitted and will act on this area. So, the pressure on this is also 1 kgf by a 1 and the force on this 
is 1 kgf into a2 by a1 because this is the pressure so what is the force it creates on this body into a2 so you see that we apply a 1 kg force here and we have created a force which is multiplied so we have created a force which can now if that a2 by a1 ratio is 100 then by applying a 1 kg a force at one end we have created a 100 kg a force at the other at the other end so the, so using this principle it, it, it is somewhat like a fluidic lever remember levers that we because of the fulcrum if we apply a small force at one end we can lift a much higher load at another end because of moment balance so here also because of pressure balance the same thing is going to happen so so we have we can we can multiply we can create very large forces and that sometimes it might create an illusion in one's mind that whether how suddenly without i mean does it uh, invalidate any any law of physics is energy conserved energy is indeed conserved because energy or power is force into velocity right so we can look at this so and that velocity comes from flow right so what is the flow the flow is what is the flow rate because uh, let us look at the next diagram then this picture will be clear so let us look at a simple hydraulic actuator so you see that we are creating a pressure here so that creates a force f depending on the area and the pressure so f is equal to p into a now let us look at the velocity what is the velocity how what is the what is the volumetric flow rate q that is equal to the area into l where l is the travel per unit time in other words l is the velocity so f is equal to p into a and q is equal to l into a or in other words we can write that v is equal to q by a so you see that what is what is the what is what is the mechanical power which is developed that will be force into velocity so f into v is equal to p into q so you see that the area does not come into the picture so the power in the power equation the area does not come into the picture and even if we try to multiply the force the energy does not get multiplied how can it get multiplied so energy is the same for a pump as we know a pump delivers a fluid at a certain rate volumetric flow rate and at a certain pressure and the pump output power is simply p into q so whatever the area the mechanical power is also p into q f into v is equal to p into q so therefore energy is conserved and and there is no contradiction so this but nevertheless so actually what is going to happen is that we will depending on what flow rate we can provide the load perhaps a very high force we can create a very high force but at the same time the rate at which that load which requires a very high force to move is going to be slow so the energy is going to be conserved that is the basic fact then so the having understood this let us first look at the let us first for, for the uh, better part of this course we will we are going to of this uh, lesson we are going to look at the components so let us start looking at the components so the most first component that comes to mind is the fluid so the fluid itself transmits the prop the power or the pressure so you create you create a you input the power and that power will in a way that that power travels through the fluid which is incompressible and delivers the power in a different form so the fluid power in terms of pressure and flow gets converted to mechanical power now these uh, there are certain things to be remembered that these are uh, these systems are of very precise create very precise motion and therefore requires parts of very precise sizes which move within one another so there is an amount of friction involved 
because otherwise the fluid is going to leak out right unless the parts are time tightly fitting then the fluid is going to leak out all over the place. So, therefore, there is an amount of friction which is likely and that is going to create lot of problems. It is going to create heat, it is going to waste energy and it is going to damage the parts. So, it is a prime importance to, to lubricate the uh, parts so that smooth frictionless motion takes place and the fluid itself one of the big advantages of hydraulics is that it does not require any additional lubrication which is often required in electric systems and in pneumatic systems because they do not have an inbuilt lubricant. Here we have an inbuilt lubricant which is the fluid itself which is used for power transmission. Even then th some amount of heat is generated because of friction and this heat and so there is a need to cool the, the components because enormous pressure exists and the fluid also cools the components. And secondly, it also removes the contaminants, you know, as things move, some small, small particles may be generated by friction. Similarly, small, small, similarly, sometimes air may come into the fluid. So, all these entrapped air, dust particles, these things have to be removed from the system and the fluid as it flows, it also cleanses these and brings it to the filter where they are filtered. A typical hydraulic fluid, fluid is actually petroleum oil. In some cases, one uses you know things like water with some with some additives or sometimes water oil mixtures. But but the most popular uh, hydraulic fluid is petroleum oil, which is uh, which is very incompressible. It has a self lubricating property. The only problem it has it has the, is, is that it tends to be somewhat hazardous for fire. Right, so that is a drawback. So it is incompressible, lubricating, and but combustible. Combustible means the flash point must be considered. Now, what does the so this is a picture which says what the what the hydraulic fluid does. So you see that the hydraulic fluid, apart from the fact that it lubricates. It cools and removes contamination. There is there is there is one point that I did not mention that is it seals also. So because of the viscosity of the oil, if you have if you if you for example the fluid here and the fluid here are going to be effectively sealed by this liquid film. So this liquid film here is going to act as a seal so that this pressure and this pressure do not uh, I mean there is an there is an effective barrier created because if these pressures leak out then the pressure cannot do effective work. So, it will be lost. So, therefore, you need to have seals and in many cases the liquid film itself creates the seal in in still other places you have to add additional seals. So, that is another thing that the liquid does. Now, how does the liquid flow? The liquid actually flows in pipes. Now, this is you know one of the this is a kind of drawback for the hydraulic system in the sense that you have to have an you have to have some piping, and you not only have to have piping from the pump to the load as the liquid is flowing because it is a liquid, so you need to also have the return line. So that adds some cost and some some maintenance. For example, in contra, in con, I mean by contrast. In pneumatic systems, you don't need those. Uh, you don't need those. You don't need the return line because you can release the air into the after it has done the work and it has come to atmospheric pressure. You can just release the air into the atmosphere, but thereby saving the cost of a return line. But that is not the case for hydraulics. You have to have a return line. So there are various kinds of lines which are used in a hydraulic system. For example, the uh, the th this is this is supposed to be a pump. And this is supposed to be a motor. So the pump is creating pressure, which is moving the motor and creating the motion. So you see that there are some lines which are shown as farm lines through which the actual liquid flows and transmit the power. They are called working lines. Then sometimes there are you 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 have to create some additional pressures at various points. So they that that's for that's for control. That's not for transmitting the power, but for controlling the direction sometimes releasing pressure. So, you need 
to create pressure at different points. So, you sometimes you, you have to use separate lines and these lines are called pilot lines. In this case, in this particular diagram, the pilot line has been derived from the working line that may or may not be the case all the time. And the pilot line is shown like you know in uh, long dashes. Similarly, you have to have some drain lines because some liquid is, is going to get uh, is, is going to leak out. So, you need to collect them so that they you know they are they, they do not uh, spill here and there, they are not lost, etcetera. So, so, so you need to add some drain lines. So, so you also have drain lines which are shown in short dashes. So, these are the typically these are these are the three kinds of lines through which fluid flows in a hydraulic system. Then you need some as I said that you need seals and fittings. Sometimes the seal is a natural seal provided by the liquid film, but sometimes you need to fittings means when you have you have pipe you have seen in your in your own house in the in the bathrooms that whenever uh, you I mean some fluid is flowing you need various kinds of fittings you need various kinds of joints right you need the pipe itself. Which can be a which can be a farm pipe. Typically in the in the in the bathrooms, it is sometimes a metal, you know, fixed pipe. Sometimes we have we now have uh, polymer pipes. So you here also you can have flexible tubings. Sometimes you can have hoses, which are you know metal reinforced uh, polymer pipes. So various kinds of pipes can be used, and along with that, various kinds of fittings and seals must be used. So this is. We are not going to dwell much on that. Only just to show, just to show what kind of a ring. For example, if you have this is an O-ring, which is a common, very common type of seal. So you see that as this is moving, uh, as this this is the this is when it is moving against pressure, this is a cylinder. So what happens is that this seal is going to be pressurized and it'll come and settle here, right? So when it it is it is actually pressed. So, when it will come and settle here, it will effectively settle, it will effectively seal this part from this part, from this part. So, this ring, this is a rubber tube. So, it will come and under pressure, it will come and it is a self sealing. Uh, under pressure, it will provide a seal. So, such seals are various kinds of seals are used. It is very important, it may not be, uh, we may not be dwelling with it, but, but unless these things are properly done, your, your hydraulic system is, is not going to work and it will be a lot of problem for the maintenance. So, from the maintenance point of view, these things are very important. Then we need a, we, we, have, we have a reservoir, you know oil is continuously circulating. So, it is starting from a reservoir, the pump is sucking the oil and then delivering it at a pressure and then it is flowing through the system and then it is coming back to the reservoir right so but apart from the fact that the reservoir holds the fluid it actually does many other things so we will so it holds the fluid obviously but it does two other things for example it dissipates heat in the reservoir the liquid gets cooled and it allows entrained air to escape. So, this removal of contaminants is done partly in the filter which is also connected closed on, on, on the pipeline close to the either on the return line generally on the return line uh, and uh, so that removes small particles from the fluid and in, in the in the reservoir the entrained air part air bubbles get removed and ent ent removing entrained air bubbles is actually very important because if you have you can Im well imagine that if you have a fluid and in which if you have uh, entrained air bubbles then the fluid does not remain incompressible anymore because if you apply pressure to the fluid it is the air bubbles which will get compressed and so therefore the fluid itself will get compressed so in technical terms the the bulk modulus of the fluid will can fall drastically if you have entrained air in it so it is very important for as we said that for effective transmission and fast quick responding transmission that the fluid is incompressible. So, therefore, it is important that air bubbles have to be removed and they get removed and the tank. So, this is the when we will when we will draw hydraulic circuits we are showing symbols side by side because 
in the coming lessons we will draw hydraulic circuits so that we understand. So, this is a this is a reservoir symbol in which we have two filters. So, coming back, so you see that the functions of the reservoir are shown. So, from hydraulic system there is something called a baffle. So, this is created so that directly otherwise if this is not created the this part of the fluid because of this low resistance directly fluid from this will get sucked into the pump. So, therefore, these fluids will not get sucked and the these fluids will not spend time in the tank. So, therefore, they, they, they will not get cooled, they, their airs will not get removed. So, therefore, a buffle is placed so that the so the fluid which comes settles around this point and the and the fluid which has come earlier actually go and enter the pump. So, this is just to create that. So, this just shows that how the pump is how the reservoir uh, does its job. Now, we come to the main comp component. So, firstly is the pump as we have seen that the, that the pump is the generator of the hydraulic energy that is it delivers fluid at a flow rate which is determined by the load and at a given pressure. Now, who drives the pump? The pump cannot generate energy by itself. So, the pump has to be generated again by some other means sometimes it is an electric motor which will drive a hydraulic pump. Sometimes especially you know hydraulics is used very much in aerospace applications sometimes you can couple the engine along with the I mean maybe bleed some gas engine gas and then run uh, a special type of motor which will move the pump. So, so, the, so, in other words the pump needs a prime mover and creates and delivers fluid at a given pressure. The motor on the other hand is the counterpart of the pump the motor receives the fluid under pressure and creates motion against the load. So, we generally so the so the pump is like a battery while the motor is like the load and these are the symbols. So, you see that the pump symbol is like this and the motor symbol is like this and there are some reversible uh, uh, if, if, if the pump and the motor are, are reversible that is they can rotate in rotate in both directions then this is the symbol. Oh sorry. There are various kinds of pumps which are used we are going to look at three typical types of pumps. So, we will first look at the piston pump or the motor in in both cases the construction is quite similar only thing is that in the pump the, the, the motion will be created by the prime mover and the fluid will be delivered while on the motor the fluid will be will come into the motor and the and the motion will be delivered. So, this is the only difference that is why we have we are showing them in a uniform manner. So, the first thing is the piston the actual piston pump which operates like this. So, you see that you can uh, you can imagine that there are a, let me let, let me let me show you let me try to show you that along the periphery of the motor along the periphery there are a number of such pistons so you can if you if you, if you take a cross section you can see this diagram right so there are this is one piston so along the periphery this is one piston the here it there is another piston here there is another piston so along the periphery there are a number of pistons two of them are being shown right and these pistons at the end is actually connected by a plate. So, you see the plate in the figure. So, see the plate in the figure. Now, you see that the plate is now you should see the plate the plate is connected at an angle theta. What does it mean that let us let, let's take the case of the pump. So, the pump is being rotated in this way by prime mover right. So, one now what you while it is rotating you can imagine that this is wh while it is while the disc is rotating here it is pushing and here it is pulling the piston right. So, what is happening is that here the fluid is being sucked in from the reservoir 
and here the fluid is getting delivered into the outlet. So, because of this angle the fluid is getting sucked here and then it is getting delivered into this outlet. So, so this, this is called a swash plate, this is called a swash plate and this delivers pressurized fluid at this outlet. On the other hand, if you apply pressured fluid here and then, then the fluid will come out through this outlet and this swash plate will actually rotate in this direction. So, that is the function of the motor. So, this is the way piston pumps move and naturally the flow rate that you can deliver depends on the number of number of cycles of the what is what is the total flow rate that depends on the number of pistons and the and the number of uh, so at during one rotation each piston will will deliver a fluid which is equal to its own volume so therefore if the number of rotations per second is x then x into that number of volume will actually get delivered in that pressure so this you can using this you can uh, compute the volume flow rate we are not computing anything we our objective is to understand only the operation on the other hand look at gear pumps in the gear pumps you have meshed gears so what is happening you can you can imagine that as these gears are rotating oh. so as these gears are rotating in this zone as this you see this this teeth is moving this way and this teeth is moving this way so here it they are compressing the fluid and some high pressure region is created on the other hand here the meshed teeth the i mean the actual drawing is not actually there has to be much closer meshing of the teeth so here the these these teeth are, are actually going away so they are opening up in one place they are closing they are like this like this so in one place they are closing so when they are closing they are they are they have a tendency of creating a pressure on the other plate they are they are actually opening so when they are opening here you have a low pressure region so obviously this low pressure region will suck in fluid from the inlet and this high pressure region will actually drive the fluid at the outlet so this is the way the gear pump works so on the other hand if you if you in the case of the motor again if you apply pressure here and if you uh, what will happen is that then it will rotate in the other direction so it will move in the other direction this will get forced out, forced and then it will it will open in the other direction and it will go go out so this is you see these two these axial piston pumps in in hydraulics we need to have the rotational speed and the fluidic rates are I mean very proportional in the sense that every time if an axial piston pump or a gear pump rotates at a at a certain rate then irrespective of the pressure a certain volume of fluid will get delivered per second right. So, the flow rate is directly proportional to the uh, rotational rate of the shaft. In this is the third kind of pump which is called a vane pump here what is happening is that you see that this is the outer casing this is the port through which fluid is going out and this is the port through which fluid is being sucked in these are the ports so you can understand and these are these are the veins these are the veins which are spring loaded actually this is not shown so this actually is pressed against the casing here there is a spring pressed against casing so what is happening you can again see here that here as it is moving the vein is always pressed against the casing so it is actually trying to take the fluid along the casing so this much of fluid is being pushed so it sort of scrapes the fluid and takes it here and as it comes here it is getting that is getting compressed so it gets delivered similarly 
So, th that is why here the fluid goes out and here it gets collected. Similarly, here it gets collected and here it goes out. So, you see that in fact, now you can now you can collect you can actually connect these outlets together and make a make one outlet and similarly you can have one inlet. So, you can have one inlet. So, then the fluid will get go this way and from here it will go this way and I mean uh, rather finally it will go. So, here you will get the overall outlet and here is the overall inlet. So, this is the way a vane pump works very simply speaking. 